The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 11 The Choice of Tara. The dazzling sunlight of Barsoom clothed Manator in an aureole of splendor as the girl and her captors rode into the city through the gate of enemies. Here the wall was some fifty feet thick, and the sides of the passageway within the gate were covered with parallel shelves of masonry from bottom to top. Within these shelves, or long horizontal niches, stood row upon row of small figures appearing like tiny, grotesque statuettes of men, their long black hair falling below their feet and sometimes trailing to the shelf beneath. The figures were scarce a foot in height, and, but for their diminutive proportions, might have been the mummified bodies of once living men. The girl noticed that as they passed the warriors saluted the figures with their spears after the manner of Barsoomian fighting men in extending a military courtesy, and then they rode on into the avenue beyond, which ran, wide and stately, through the city toward the east. On either side were great buildings wondrously wrought. Paintings of great beauty and antiquity covered many of the walls, their colors softened and blended by the suns of ages. Upon the pavement the life of the newly awakened city was already afoot, women in brilliant trappings, befeathered warriors, their bodies daubed with paint, artisans, armed but less gaily comparisoned, took their various ways upon the duties of the day. A giant zitatar, magnificent in rich harness, rumbled its broad-wheeled cart along the stone pavement toward the gate of enemies. Life and color and beauty wrought together a picture that filled the eyes of Tara of Helium with wonder and admiration for here was a scene out of the dead past of dying Mars. Such had been the cities of the founders of her race before Thraxius, mightiest of oceans, had disappeared from the face of the world, and from balconies on either side men and women looked down in silence upon the scene below. The people in the street looked at the two prisoners, especially at the hideous Gek, and called out in question or comment to their guard but the watchers upon the balcony spoke not, nor did one so much as turn ahead to note their passing. There were many balconies on each building, and not a one that did not hold its silent party of richly trapped men and women, with here and there a child or two, but even the children maintained their uniform silence and immobility of their elders. As they approached the center of the city the girls saw that even the roofs bore companies of these idle watchers harnessed and bejeweled as for some gala day of laughter and music, but no laughter broke from these silent lips, nor any music from the strings of the instruments that many of them held in jeweled fingers. And now the avenue widened into an immense square, at the far end of which rose a stately edifice gleaming white in virgin marble among the gaily painted buildings surrounding it, and its scarlet sward and gaily flowering green foliage shrubbery. Toward this Udor led his prisoners and their guard to the great arched entrance before which a line of fifty mounted warriors barred the way. When the commander of the guard recognized Udor, the guardsmen fell back to either side, leaving a broad avenue through which the party passed. Directly inside the entrance were inclined runways leading upward on either side. Udor turned to the left and led them upward to the second floor and down a long corridor. Here they passed other mounted men, and in chambers upon either side they saw more. Occasionally there was another runway, leading either up or down. A warrior, his steed at full gallop, dashed into sight from one of those and raced swiftly past them upon some errand. Nowhere as yet had Tara of Helium seen a man afoot in this great building, but when at a turn Udor led them to the third floor she caught glimpses of chambers in which many riderless thoats were penned, 
and others adjoining where dismounted warriors lolled at ease or played games of skill or chance, and many there were who played at Jitan, and then the party passed into a long, wide hall of state, as magnificent an apartment as even a princess of mighty helium ever had seen. The length of the room ran an arched ceiling ablaze with countless radium bulbs. The mighty spans extended from wall to wall, leaving the vast floor unbroken by a single column. The arches were of white marble, apparently quarried in single, huge blocks, from which each arch was cut complete. Between the arches the ceiling was set solid about the radium bulbs with precious stones, whose scintillant fire and color and beauty filled the whole apartment. The stones were carried down the walls, in an irregular fringe for a few feet, where they appeared to hang like a beautiful and gorgeous drapery against the white marble of the wall. The marble ended some six or seven feet from the floor, the walls from that point down being wainscoted in solid gold. The floor itself was of marble richly inlaid with gold, in that single room was a vast treasure equal to the wealth of many a large city. But what riveted the girl's attention even more than the fabulous treasure of decorations were the files of gorgeously harnessed warriors who sat their thoats in grim silence and immobility of either side of the central aisle, rank after rank of them to the farther walls, and as the party passed between them she could not note so much as the flicker of an eyelid or the twitching of a thoat's ear. "'The Hall of Chiefs,' whispered one of her guard, evidently noting her interest. There was a note of pride in the fellow's voice, and something of hushed awe. Then they passed through a great doorway into the chamber beyond, a large square room in which a dozen mounted warriors lolled in their saddles. As Udor and his party entered the room, the warriors came quickly erect in their saddles and formed a line before another door upon the opposite side of the wall. The padwar commanding them saluted Udor, who, with his party, had halted facing the guard. "'Send one to Otar, announcing that Udor brings two prisoners worthy of the observation of the great Jeddak," said Udor, one because of her extreme beauty, the other because of his extreme ugliness. "'Otar sits in council with the lesser chiefs,' replied the lieutenant. "'But the words of Udor the Dwar shall be carried to him,' and he turned and gave instructions to one who sat his thoat behind him. "'What manner of creature is the male?' he asked of Udor. "'It cannot be that both are of one race.' "'They were together in the hills south of the city,' explained Udor, "'and they say they are lost and starving.' "'The woman is beautiful,' said the Padwar. "'She will not long go begging in the city of Manator.' And then they spoke of other matters, of the doings of the palace, of the expedition of Udor, until the messenger returned to say that Otar bade them bring the prisoners to him. They passed then through a massive doorway, which, when opened, revealed the great council chamber of Otar, Jeddak of Manator, beyond. A central aisle led from the doorway the full length of the great hall, terminating at the steps of a marble dais upon which a man sat in a great throne chair. Upon either side of the aisle were ranged rows of highly carved desks and chairs of skeel, a hardwood of great beauty. Only a few of the desks were occupied, those in the front row, just below the rostrum. At the entrance Udor dismounted with four of his followers, who formed a guard about the two prisoners, who were then conducted toward the foot of the throne, following a few paces behind Udor. As they halted at the foot of the marble steps, the proud gaze of Tara of Helium rested upon the enthroned figure of the man above her. He sat erect, without stiffness, a commanding presence trapped in the barbaric splendor that the Barsoomian chieftain loves. He was a large man, the perfection of whose handsome face was marred only by the hauteur of his cold eyes and the suggestion of cruelty imparted by two thin lips. It needed no second glance to assure the least observing that here indeed was a ruler of men 
a fighting jeddak whose people might worship but not love, and for whose slightest favor warriors would vie with one another to go forth and die. This was Otar, jeddak of Manator, and as Tara of Helium saw him for the first time she could not but acknowledge a certain admiration for this savage chieftain who so virilely personified the ancient virtues of the god of war. Udor and the Jeddak interchanged the simple greetings of Barsoom, and then the former recounted the details of the discovery and the capture of the prisoners. Otar scrutinized them both intently during Udor's narration of events, his expression revealing naught of what passed in the brain behind those inscrutable eyes. When the officer had finished, the Jeddak fashioned his gaze upon Ghek. "'And you?' he asked. "'What manner of thing are you? From what country? Why are you in Manator?' "'I am a Kaldane,' replied Ghek, the highest type of created creature upon the face of Barsoom. "'I am mind. You are matter. I come from Bantoom. I am here because we were lost and starving.' And you, Otar turned suddenly on Terra, you too are a Kaldane? I am a princess of Helium, replied the girl. I was a prisoner in Bantoom. This Kaldane and a warrior of my own race rescued me. The warrior left us to search for food and water. He has doubtless fallen into the hands of your people. I ask you to free him and give us food and drink and let us go upon our way. I am a granddaughter of a Jeddak, the daughter of a Jeddak of Jeddaks, the warlord of Barsoom. I ask only the treatment that my people would accord you or yours. Helium, repeated Otar. I know not of Helium, nor does the Jeddak of Helium rule Manator. I, Otar, am Jeddak of Manator. I alone rule. I protect my own. You have never seen a man or a warrior of Manator captive in Helium. Why should I protect the people of another Jeddak? It is his duty to protect them. If he cannot, he is weak, and his people must fall into the hands of the strong. I, Otar, am strong. I will keep you. That, he pointed at Ghek, can it fight? It is brave, replied Tara of Helium but it has not the skill at arms which my people possess. "'There is none, then, to fight for you?' asked Otar. "'We are a just people,' he continued, without waiting for a reply. "'And had you one to fight for you, he might win to freedom for himself and you as well.' "'But Udor assured me that no stranger ever had departed from Manator,' she answered. Otar shrugged. That does not disprove the justice of the laws of Manator, replied Otar, but rather that the warriors of Manator are invincible. Had there come one who could defeat our warriors, that one had won to liberty. And you fetch my warrior, cried Tara heartily. You shall see such swordplay as doubtless the crumbling walls of your decaying city never have witnessed, and if there be no trick in your offer, we are already as good as free. Otar smiled more broadly than before, and Udor smiled too, and the chiefs and warriors who looked on nudged one another and whispered, laughing, and Tara of Helium knew then that there was some trickery in their justice, but though her situation seemed hopeless she did not cease to hope, for was she not the daughter of John Carter, warlord of Barsoom, whose famous challenge to fate, I still live? remained the one irreducible defense against despair? At thought of her noble sire the patrician chin of Tara of Helium rose a shade higher. Ah, if he but knew where she was there was little to fear them. The ghosts of Helium would batter at the gates of Manator. The great green warriors of John Carter's savage allies would swarm up from the dead sea bottoms, lusting for pillage and for loot. The stately ships of her beloved navy would soar above the unprotected towers and minarets of the doomed city, which only capitulation and heavy tribute could then save. But John Carter did not know. There was only one other to whom she might hope to look, 
Turan the Panthan. But where was he? She had seen his sword in play, and she knew that it had been wielded by a master hand, and who should know sword play better than Tara of Helium, who had learned it well under the constant tutorage of John Carter himself? Tricks she knew that discounted even far greater physical proudness than her own, and a method of attack that might have been at once the envy and despair of the cleverest of warriors. And so it was that her thoughts turned to Turan the Panthan, though not alone because of the protection he might afford her. She had realized, since he had left her in search of food, that there had grown between them a certain comradeship that she now missed. There had been that about him which seemed to have bridged the gulf between their stations in life. With him she had failed to consider that he was a panthan, or that she was a princess. They had been comrades. Suddenly she realized that she missed him for himself more than for his sword. She turned toward Otar. "'Where is Turan, my warrior?' she demanded. "'You shall not lack for warriors,' replied the Jeddak. "'One of your beauty shall find plenty to fight for her. Possibly it shall not be necessary to look further than the Jeddak of Manator. You please me, woman. What say you to such an honor?' Through narrowed lids the Princess of Helium scrutinized the Jeddak of Manator from feathered headdress to sandaled foot and back to feathered headdress. Honor! she mimicked in tones of scorn. I please thee, do I? Then know, swine, that thou pleasest me not, that the daughter of John Carter is not for such as thou. A sudden tense silence fell upon the assembled chiefs. Slowly the blood receded from the sinister face of Otar, Jeddak of Manator leaving him a sickly purple in his wrath. His eyes narrowed to two thin slits. His lips were compressed to a bloodless line of malevolence. For a long moment there was no sound in the throne room of the palace at Manator. Then the Jeddak turned toward Udor. "'Take her away,' he said in a level voice that belied his appearance of rage. "'Take her away, and at the next games let the prisoners and the common warriors play at Jitan for her. And this? asked Udor, pointing at Ghek. To the pits until the next games, replied Otar. So this is your vaunted justice, cried Tara of Helium, that two strangers who have not wronged you shall be sentenced without trial, and one of them is a woman? The swine of Manator are as just as they are brave. Away with her! shouted Otar and at a sign from Udor the guards formed about the two prisoners and conducted them from the chamber. Outside the palace Ghek and Tara of Helium were separated. The girl was led through long avenues toward the center of the city, and finally into a low building topped by lofty towers of massive construction. Here she was turned over to a warrior who wore the insignia of a dwar or captain. It is Otar's wish, explained Udor to this one, that she be kept until the next games, when the prisoners and the common warriors shall play for her. Had she not the tongue of a thoat, she had been a worthy stake for our noblest seal. And Udor sighed, perhaps even yet I may win a pardon for her. It were too bad to see such beauty fall to the lot of some common fellow. I would have honored her myself. If I am to be imprisoned, imprison me, said the girl. I do not recall that I was sentenced to listen to the insults of every low-born boor who chanced to admire me. You see, Akor, cried Udor, the tongue that she has? Even so, and worse, spoke she to Otar the Jeddak. I see, replied Akor, whom Tara saw was with difficulty restraining a smile. Come then with me, woman, he said and we shall find a safe place within the towers of Jitan. But stay, what ails thee?" The girl had staggered, and would have fallen had not the man caught her in his arms. She seemed to gather herself then, and bravely sought to stand erect without support. Akor glanced at Udor. "'Knew ye the woman was ill?' he asked. "'Possibly it is lack of food,' replied the other. She mentioned, I believe, that she and her companions had not eaten for several days. 
brave are the warriors of Otar, sneered Akor. Lavish their hospitality. Udor, whose riches are uncounted, and the brave Otar, whose squealing thoats are stabled within marble halls and fed from troughs of gold, can spare no crust to feed a starving girl? The black-haired Udor scowled. Thy tongue will yet pierce thy heart, son of a slave, he cried. Once too often mayst thus try the patience of the just Otar. Hereafter guard thy speech as well as thy towers. Think not to taunt me with my mother's state, said Akor. Tis the blood of the slave woman that fills my veins with pride, and my only shame is that I am also the son of thy Jeddak. And Otar heard this? queried Udor. Otar has already heard it from mine own lips, replied Akor. This and more. He turned upon his heels, a supporting arm still around the waist of Tara of Helium, and thus he half led, half carried her into the towers of Jitan, while Udor wheeled his thoat and galloped back in the direction of the palace. Within the main entrance to the tower of Jitan lolled a half-dozen warriors. To one of these spoke Akor, keeper of the towers. Fetch Lano, the slave girl, and bid her bring food and drink to the upper level of the Thurian tower. Then he lifted the half-fainting girl in his arms and bore her along the spiral-inclined runway that led upward within the tower. Somewhere in the long ascent Tara lost consciousness. When it returned she found herself in a large circular chamber, the stone walls of which were pierced by windows at regular intervals about the entire circumference of the room. She was lying upon a pile of sleeping silks and furs, while there knelt above her a young woman who was forcing drops of some cooling beverage between her parched lips. Tara of Helium half rose upon an elbow and looked about. In the first moments of returning consciousness there were swept from the screen of recollection the happenings of many weeks. She thought that she awoke in the palace of the warlord at Helium, her brows knit as she scrutinized the strange face bending over her. "'Who are you?' she asked. "'And where is Uthia?' "'I am Lano, the slave girl,' replied the other. "'I know none by the name of Uthia.' Tara of Helium sat erect and looked about her. This rough stone was not the marble of her father's halls. "'Where am I?' she asked. "'In the Thurian Tower,' replied the girl, and then seeing that the other still did not understand, she guessed the truth. "'You are a prisoner in the Towers of Jitan, in the city of Manator,' she explained. "'You were brought to this chamber, weak and fainting by Akor, dwar of the Towers of Jitan, who sent me to you with food and drink, for kind is the heart of Ator.' "'I remember now,' said Tara slowly. "'I remember.' But where is Turan, my warrior? Did they speak of him? I heard not of another, replied Lano. You alone were brought to the towers. In that you are fortunate, for there be no nobler man in Manator than Akor. It is his mother's blood that makes him so. She was a slave girl from Gaithal. Gaithal! exclaimed Tara of Helium. Lies Gaithal close by Manator? Not close. Yet still the nearest country, replied Lano, about twenty-two degrees east it lies. Gaithal, murmured Tara, far Gaithal. But you are not from Gaithal, said the slave girl. Your harness is not of Gaithal. I am from Helium, said Tara. It is far from Helium to Gaithal, said the slave girl. But in our studies we learn much of the greatness of Helium, we of Gaithal so it seems not so far away. "'You too are from Gaithal?' asked Tara. "'Many of us are from Gaithal who are slaves in Manator,' replied the girl. "'It is to Gaithal, nearest country, that the Mantorians look for slaves most often. They go in great numbers at intervals of three or seven years, and haunt the roads that lead to Gaithal, and thus they capture whole caravans, leaving none to bear warning to Gaithal of their fate. Nor do any ever escape from Manator to carry word of us back to Gahan or Jed. 
Tara of Helium ate slowly and in silence. The girl's words aroused memories of the last hour she had spent in her father's palace, and the great midday function at which she had met Gahan of Gathol. Even now she flushed as she recalled his daring words. Upon her reveries the door opened, and a burly warrior appeared in the opening, a hulking fellow with thick lips and an evil, leering face. The slave girl sprang to her feet, facing him. "'What does this mean, Emed?' she cried. "'Was it not the will of Akor that this woman be not disturbed?' "'The will of Akor, indeed,' and the man sneered. "'The will of Akor is without power in the towers of Jitan or elsewhere, for Akor lies now in the pits of Otar, and Emed is dwar of the towers.' Tara of Helium saw the face of the slave girl pale, and the terror in her eyes. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 11, Recording by Tom Weiss.